The House Appropriations Subcommittee on Health and Human Services is called to order. Clerk, please take the roll. Chair Morris. Here. Representative Martis. Here. Representative Hood. Representative Brabett. Here. Representative O'Neill. Representative Curry. Here. Representative Farhat. Representative Price. Here. Representative Skaggs. Here. Representative Snyder. Here. Representative Green. Present. Representative Bolin. Here. Representative Meerman. Representative Kuhn. Here. Representative Steele. Here. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you, Clerk. Rep Steele moves to appro approve the minutes of March 1st, 2023. Seeing no objection, the minutes are approved. Welcome everybody. Uh, we're happy today to be, uh, to have some presentations from HHS on the executive recommendation for 2023-24 on aging, behavioral, and physical health services. Uh, again, it's a very important aspect of the HHS budget providing health care for many Michiganders across the state. Uh, so with that, I recognize Farah Hanley, Chief Deputy Director for Health, and Amy Epke, Senior Dep Deputy Director for Financial Operations. Please join us and go ahead with your presentation. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. And uh, members of the subcommittee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here with you today. I am grateful for the opportunity to share with you all the incredible initiatives and efforts that are supported by our employees in the Behavioral and Physical Health and Aging Services Administration. I'm eager to share the work we have here with you today, but before I do, I'd like to introduce you to our fantastic leadership team at what we call BP HASA all of whom make me look good every single day. If you guys don't mind, I would just like to uh, give a little wave of your hands as I call your name, uh, all in alphabetical order. Erin Emerson, who's our Senior Policy Executive over the Office of Strategic Partnerships and Medicaid Administrative Services, and I'm not looking back, so I trust you guys are gonna wave your hands. <laughs> Nicole Hudson, Senior Advisor on Special Projects. Kristen Jordan, Senior Advisor on Behavioral Health Services. Brian Kiesling, our Senior Bureau Director on, on Medicaid Policy, Operations, and Actuarial Services. Jed Miller is our Senior Physician Manager of the Office of Medical Affairs. Penny Rutledge is our Senior Bureau Director of Medicaid Care Management and Customer Service. Scott Walmsley is our Senior Bureau Director of the Bureau of Aging, Community Living, and Supports and Jeff Weifrich is our Senior Bureau Director of the Bureau of Specialty Behavioral Health Services. And I did count, collectively, our leadership team comprises 136 years of Medicaid policy expertise. So if we don't have the answer to your question, I'm really not sure where you're gonna find it, <laughs> but we will certainly be happy to speak with you and um, uh, address any concerns or inquiries that you have. Today we're gonna to share some background on Michigan's broad Medicaid program and the services provided. We'll talk a little bit about the different service delivery systems we employ in our state. We'll highlight our large current initiatives, including some helpful background on efforts that have been underway for the last 18 months to prepare for the unwinding of the public health emergency. And we'll conclude with a summary of our FY24 executive recommendation investment proposals. Authorized by Title 19 of the Social Security Act, Medicaid, which is primarily health insurance for low income individuals, was signed into law in 1965 alongside Medicare, which is primarily health insurance for older adults. All states, the District of Columbia and the US territories have Medicaid programs designed to provide health coverage for low income people. Although the federal government establishes certain parameters for all states to follow, each state administers their Medicaid program differently, resulting in variations in Medicaid coverage across the country. 
As a famous saying among many health policy experts goes, you've seen one Medicaid program, you've seen one Medicaid program. In Michigan, almost one third of the state population receives its health care coverage from the Medicaid program. This includes more than 1 million children, 326,000 people living with disabilities, 157,000 seniors, and now more than 1 million adults between the ages of 21 and 64 enrolled in the Healthy Michigan Plan, also known as Michigan's Medicaid Expansion Program, which took effect in 2014 after the Affordable Care Act was signed into law. As mentioned, Michigan's Medicaid program is large and covers almost one-third of our state's total population. While percentages are high in some densely populated areas, as you see on this map, the percentages of individuals covered by Medicaid are also high in more rural areas, suggesting the wide range of coverage and geographic variation and distribution across the state. And we're happy to provide a, a larger map of that uh, for all of you if you'd like that. These two pie charts demonstrate that while a sizable number of individuals are children and families, the significant costs are associated with serving the aging population and those living with disabilities, reflecting the disproportionately higher costs of care for the smaller population. In Michigan, about 39% of children enrolled in Medicaid represent only about 21% of the total spending in the program, while about 15% of the aging population and those living with disabilities represents 45% of the total spend. Medicaid spending varies widely by service. Hospital care constitutes approximately one-third of the Medicaid spend in any given year, while dental care has historically made up 2% of the annual Medicaid spend. After the historic investment in dental care as supported by this legislature in FY23, and with the steady growth of the aging population, we can expect to see some shifts in these figures in future years, but the wide variation in the aggregate will continue. Our programs have many services, each with its own provider groups, reimbursement formulas, and policies behind them. These services are multifaceted and complex to administer. And again, as I like to say, we have multiple Medicaid programs in our state, not just one. Michigan has been a leader in the nation as it relates to the historic management of costs. Some individuals here in this room, whether state employees or outside of state government, have had the privilege of working with Paul Reinhardt, Michigan's former Medicaid director from the mid-2000s. Prior to that, Paul worked in the state budget office where he, alongside employees like myself, had one mission, and that was to minimize state general fund costs while allowing Medicaid access and services to be fully supported and in many cases expanded. Due to his ingenuity, we were able to maintain state general fund growth of Medicaid for years. And this chart demonstrates the success of that work as compared to Medicare, general health insurance premiums, and national health expenditures per capita. His work in that office and then as Medicaid director along many members of this current leadership team is I believe what has sustained Michigan Medicaid's financial health. That work continues into today with special partnerships with providers and I would just be remiss if I didn't mention his contributions to the state of Michigan. I want to talk a bit to you today, uh, I, I talk a bit with you today about service delivery programs. Service delivery systems is a method for paying providers to support benefits. Historically, most state Medicaid programs delivered and paid for services for Medicaid beneficiaries on a fee-for-service basis, directly paying providers a fee for each service they furnish. The fee-for-service payment model 
by definition, rewards volume irrespective of patient health outcomes or quality of care. Also, care provided in fee-for-service can often be fragmented because there is no coordinating entity and both redundancies and gaps in patient care can result. And finally, beneficiaries are on their own in fee-for-service systems to identify providers who participate in Medicaid and are taking new patients. Increasingly, state Medicaid programs have been expanding their use of managed care, as well as other service delivery and payment models, such as alternative, as alternatives to traditional fee-for-service. States may have different purposes in doing so, including to improve beneficiary access to care, improve the quality of care, and increase Medicaid budget predictability and reduce Medicaid spending. Managed care, getting into a little bit more detail, is a healthcare delivery system organized to manage cost, utilization, and quality. Medicaid managed care plans provide the delivery of Medicaid health benefits and additional services through contracted arrangements between Michigan Medicaid and its partnering managed care organizations. These plans accept a set per member per month or capitation payment for these services. By contracting with various types of managed care organizations to deliver Medicaid program health care services to their beneficiaries, Michigan Medicaid has more predictable program costs and more efficiently manages the utilization of health services. Improvement in health plan performance, health care quality, improved access, and positive outcomes are key objectives of Michigan's Medicaid managed care service delivery model. The large majority of individuals enrolled in the Medicaid program receive their benefits through one of the nine contracted Medicaid health plans. These plans provide a comprehensive array of services as noted on the right-hand side of this chart. Plans have been partners with the state for decades and the relationship between our state agency and the contracted health plans has been strong. While Michigan was a leader on this front, today capitated managed care is the dominant way in which states, including Michigan, deliver services to Medicaid enrollees. Historically, most state Medicaid programs delivered and paid for services for Medicaid beneficiaries on a fee-for-service basis, which is that second service delivery model that I mentioned. On a fee-for-service basis, we directly pay providers a fee for each service they furnish. While Michigan has broadly adopted a managed care service delivery model approach, not all beneficiaries are enrolled in a managed care plan. Fee-for-service is another service delivery model the state uses for certain populations, such as those noted on the slide. Fee-for-service means that MDHHS pays doctors and healthcare professionals directly for each Medicaid service they provide. So in this simple example, a Medicaid member visits the doctor for a checkup, the doctor charges Medicaid for that service, and Michigan Medicaid pays the doctor a set rate for that checkup. These rates are paid the, uh, based on the state's established fee schedule and are paid to all fee-for-service providers regardless of their charges. Certain populations, such as migrants and tribal members, may voluntarily enroll in managed care, while others, such as individuals in institutional settings, or with other comprehensive health coverage are excluded from enrollment in managed care to prevent duplication in care management and avoid monthly costs when the managed care return on investment does not exist. Michigan's Medicaid specialty behavioral health system is managed by 10 prepaid and patient health plans with one per region. These publicly managed care entities are formed by community mental health services providers in their region. Seven of the PHPs are made up of an affiliation of multiple CMHSPs, as few as four and as many as 12, while the Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb County community mental health service providers 
also serve as their region's PIHP. The PIHP contracts with the community mental health organizations and with other behavioral health providers within the region deliver necessary, to deliver necessary services to children and adults in need of specialty behavioral health services, and those include substance use disorder treatment. The PIHPs receive a monthly capitation rate to support the provision of these services. But unlike the full risk contracts with the Medicaid health plans, the PIHPs share the financial risk for the provision of these services in the state. As noted on the previous slide, CMHSPs are integral to Michigan's specialty behavioral health system. There are 46 of these community mental health service providers across the state of Michigan. Community mental health service providers serve two broad functions. One, they provide the community safety net services outlined in the mental health code. And two, they serve as the provider of Medicaid supports and services through a contract with the designated prepaid and patient health plan or PIHP in their region. Individuals who are served in the specialty system include anyone who is experiencing a crisis, adults with serious mental illness, children with serious emotional disturbance, adults and children with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and adults and youth with substance use disorders. In fiscal year 22, the specialty system served over 300,000 individuals. Our Medicaid programs support a broad array of long-term care supports and services listed here. I'll highlight some of them briefly. My Health Link is a com complete integrated healthcare program for Michigan residents who are enrolled in both Medicaid and Medicare. My Health Link offers a broad range of medical and behavioral health services, pharmacy, home and community-based services, and nursing home care, all in a single program designed to meet individual needs. While the program is not statewide currently, it is available to dual eligibles in 25 counties across the state. We are preparing for a large transition from in the My Health Link program, as indicated on the footnote of this slide, but we will be talking more about that in details a bit later following this slide later in the presentation. The My Choice waiver program provides Medicaid covered long-term care services and supports in a home or residential setting for individuals who meet the medical functional criteria for nursing facility level of care. Through My Choice, eligible adults who meet income and asset criteria can receive Medicaid covered services like those provided by nursing homes, but can stay in their own home or another residential setting. This waiver became available in all Michigan counties on October 1, 1998, and has continued to expand since that time, now successfully serving approximately 16,000 individuals. Our program of all-inclusive care for the elderly, also known as PACE, is a Medicare and Medicaid program that helps people meet their health care needs in the community instead of going to a nursing home or other facility. PACE covers all Medicare and Medicaid covered services and other services that the PACE team of healthcare professionals decides are necessary to improve and maintain an individual's health. Michigan has 14 independent PACE organizations that serve 24 locations throughout the state today. However, PACE continues to expand in Michigan. For FY23, we have one expansion taking place in Macomb County. For FY24, we're looking forward to a new PACE center in Alpena. This is important as Alpena is an underserved area of the state, and we're also pleased to see expansions in Niles, Lowell, and Westland. Home Help is another state Medicaid program tailored for aging Michiganders and those living with disabilities 
who require assistance with their daily and instrumental living activities. This program services include personal care, such as bathing and toileting, as well as assistance with laundry and shopping for essentials. Similar to the other home and community-based programs described previously, the Home Help Program is intended to promote independence at home and delay institutionalization. And finally, Michigan's 430 plus nursing homes provide 24 seven skilled care to individuals who need full time support. Nursing homes must be licensed and certified by LARA, which is our state survey agency, in order to receive Medicaid reimbursement. Medicaid is the largest single payer for the nursing home care in the country. As a result, despite the myriad of other home and community based programs in Michigan, nursing homes continue to be the primary driver of costs for our long-term supports and services. In the early 80s, Michigan lawmakers recognized that the older generation requires protection and special care. That is why they created the Older Michiganians Act, which created the Commission on Services to the Aging to provide oversight and support to programs for our older adults. In addition, oversight of these programs includes work performed by the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, Bureau of Aging, Community Living and Supports, as well as the State Advisory Council on Aging and the state's long-term care ombudsman. Taken together, Michigan senior programs are supported by much needed organizations to ensure seniors in the state have representation and that they get the services they need. Our programs for older adults are largely administered by a comprehensive network of providers, largely supported by our 16 area agencies on aging in the state. These agencies ensure that clear tenants of these programs are met, including access, supports for elder rights, utilizing offerings from volunteers, caregivers, an emphasis on in-home services, senior employment opportunities, and a focus on community-based supports and services. Balancing these different pillars ensures that services for our older adults cover critical needs for this vulnerable population. And just briefly, some aging network program highlights I'd like to share include for our senior nutrition, in FY22, the Aging Network provided the following nutrition services, 1.4 million congregate meals to 35,000 older adults, and 8.7 million home-delivered meals to 50, 52,000 older adults and caregivers, and 187,000 grab-and-go meals. I'd like to highlight for you now some of the current efforts underway to address access, capacity, and quality of care. And during this discussion, I will also spend some time on the efforts taking place related to our public health emergency. Michigan ranks third in the nation with the highest shortages of mental health professionals. We struggle to hire, and retain enough qualified staff to provide psychiatric services statewide. And as I travel the state, and as I'm sure you all have heard, the number one theme I hear, not only from our behavioral health providers, but all providers across the spectrum of the Medicaid program is the challenge related to workforce recruitment and retention efforts. At the Department of Health and Human Services, I, along with Al Jansen and Megan Groen, chair a workforce steering committee that has a very simple vision, develop and implement a comprehensive short and long-term strategic plan to address the healthcare and human services workforce shortage. We've developed an all hands on deck approach to the workforce shortage, establishing a steering committee that has been broken out by various action teams implementing quick short-term fixes, as well as strategizing on longer ones. And as you'll see on this slide, we have expanded training to the direct care workforce by almost $3 million. We've provided flexibility through a Medicaid policy that allows for reimbursement of certain clinical degrees prior to receiving licensure. 
we're expanding our public awareness campaign to reduce the stigma around behavioral health careers. We're working directly with universities to expand cohorts of students for psychiatric mental health nurse practitioners to reduce underserved communities and more. And while these are helpful, we know that they address the workforce shortage, but addressing the workforce shortage is not only a short-term fix, it is also a long-term endeavor, and the department is committed to it. You may have heard that we have something that some folks call an ED boarding issue. We have individuals with mental illness or are developmentally disabled not receiving appropriate care because they are not in the appropriate setting and are either sitting in emergency rooms or in hospital med surge units. We need to move individuals who are in state psychiatric hospitals that are ready to be discharged out to the community so that our private hospital partners who are working hard every day to establish these patients, to stabilize these patients, can move them to the state where they can be appropriately treated. In order for all of this to work, we've established an intensive community transition services benefit. Last year, the legislature funded 60 placements in the intensive community transition based settings to focus on those getting ready for discharge in state psychiatric hospitals to getting them back into the community with that transitional level of care. Doing so will relieve pressure on our hospitals and will better move individuals to their appropriate placements. All of these efforts strengthen our continuum of care, allowing us to provide access to appropriate care whenever and wherever people need it. The Federal Families First Coronavirus Response Act that required state Medicaid agencies to continue health care coverage for all medical assistance programs, even if someone's eligibility changed, has been put in place. This provision was tied directly to the COVID-19 public health emergency. Most recently, the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2023 decoupled the continuous enrolled provisions from the end of the public health emergency, and it instructed states to begin Medicaid redeterminations no later than April 2023. In accordance with CMS guidance, the redeterminations timeline that MDHHS has chosen to restart renewals for the June cohort of beneficiaries. This means that the state will begin passively renewing beneficiaries in April. Send redetermination packets to those needing one in May and processing redeterminations in June. On July 1st, 2023, the first cohort of terminations will be effective for those individuals who do not qualify for Medicaid. Monthly alert letters have already been sent out last week for those individuals whose eligibility anniversary is in June. Could you go back to the previous slide? I just wanna mention one thing. Passive renewals, as I mentioned, for April 2023 are done by checking income and bridges. I just want to focus a little bit more on passive renewals. Um, we are able to do so by looking at income eligibility and food assistance determination. So while the department has been working diligently to increase that number of individuals in April 2023 who are passively renewed, we are still assessing the impact of these efforts and we really won't know until the redetermination process is underway more this summer. Just wanted to say that, thank you. MDHHS will be engaged in a robust communication strategy to ensure beneficiaries remain updated on the latest information. Ads will run on the radio, audio streaming platforms, through mobile and social media campaigns, including those 
you know, annoying screens at the gas station pumps, including those. We will also be leveraging minority media outlets and trusted community partners to share information and updates. We've developed a robust stakeholder toolkit, which we will be providing to all of you next week for you to see the information we're providing that will allow health plans, partners, community partners, providers, and other stakeholders to leverage the same message to help ensure consistent and clear communications. We will continue to leverage overall data through the unwind period to adjust the media campaign as needed, and we will provide focused outreach to communities or populations losing their coverage. MDHHS has routine communications with key partners, including all of our health plans, the hospital association, the primary care association, the prepaid and patient health plans, and the CMH Association, just to name a few. We will be holding a webinar in less than two weeks on March 20th with the Hospital and Primary Care Association to walk providers, including healthcare facilities and hospitals, through the redetermination timeline, along with the communications tool available. In addition, we will hold a legislative briefing right after spring break in April to provide you with additional detail on how things are going and continue to ask and answer your questions. We are leveraging all of our managed care plans from the Medicaid health plans to the integrated care organizations to the prepaid and inpatient health plans, the My Choice waiver agents, and the PACE organizations to conduct routine member outreach, including general awareness messages, reminders during the redetermination process, and follow up after closure to let beneficiaries know their options. To support these efforts, MDHHS will be providing lists of individuals due for renewal each month to help target outreach. MDHHS will also supply a monthly file of those who transitioned off of Medicaid coverage through the redetermination process, along with basic information about why their Medicaid coverage ended to help inform outreach and messaging to these individuals. Managed care plans will utilize the department's developed toolkit, as I previously discussed, to ensure a clear and consistent message. The toolkit will be shared electronically again with all legislative offices to provide insight into the communications plan for the public. Specific to our behavioral health partners, we do meet with the prepaid and patient health plans monthly and with the community mental health service providers on a quarterly basis. In each of these meetings for the last year, the department has provided a PHE unwind update to assure broad awareness and the opportunity to dialogue around needs and concerns. And I will also tell you that all of these providers have my number and I talk to them frequently. <laughs> we requested the support of the PIHPs and CMHSPs in conducting outreach and education to those they serve. Initially, we've asked that they share the update your contact information message and assist individuals in doing so through my bridges should they need support. As we near closer to the renewals resuming, we will be sharing several monthly files with our prepaid and patient health plans to facilitate robust outreach across three key themes. General awareness, reminders during the redetermination period, and follow-up after closure to support re-enrollment or marketplace transitions. Toolkits for the PIHPs and CMHSPs will be shared and developed in a way that makes the most sense for them within their region. To help ensure the department has right-sized the staffing needed to manage the monthly caseload of redeterminations, MDHHS has taken several proactive steps to build capacity in our local offices so that we have the resources we need over the next 13 months. 
We are converting internal positions to broaden the pool of eligibility staff available during this all hands on deck period. We are bringing back retirees, those who have recently retired and have a wealth of experience. We are hiring additional staff and we've added capacity to the MyBridges help desk, which will ensure that beneficiaries needing assistance with MyBridges or password reset can quickly be served. And I did not mention earlier this uh, in the presentation that I believe we're also joined by Lou Rubel, who hopefully is raising his hand, and he is the Chief Deputy for Opportunity overseeing our human services programs. He can certainly answer questions related to this. I would be happy to defer to him on that slide. The Department and the Department of Insurance and Financial Services are collaborating together closely to ensure alignment across all areas. We have implemented a joint marketplace coordination workgroup to support robust interagency communication and coordination. We have released joint guidance to MDHHS's contracted Medicaid health plans regarding permissible beneficiary outreach, including establishing an outreach strategy for the Medicaid health plans that offer a marketplace plan. We've developed an outreach strategy to assure that individuals who are transitioning from Medicaid due to excess income are aware of their options for staying covered. This includes providing education about the federal marketplace option in Michigan and how to find additional resources, including navigators and assisters in their community. We're also building a website for specific marketplace information and education related to the public health emergency. And before I pivot to other uh, topics, before I leave the public health emergency topic, I just wanna take a minute to touch on our broader public health emergency related work. While we recognize that redeterminations deservedly get the majority of attention, it is not our only PHE unwind activity keeping us busy. In addition to this, we have been reviewing more than 100 different policies that were put into place when the PHE was initiated to ensure a smooth transition as we phase out. One of the many opportunities that COVID actually did bring was an awareness on better ways to deliver healthcare services, such as through telehealth. While some changes had to be made to come into alignment with the post-health emergency world, as we reviewed our policies, we have largely kept our telehealth benefit in place. Aside from shifting some audio only to either face-to-face -face calls or some in-person for initial evaluation appointments, we recognize the importance of the telehealth option in Medicaid. We've captured significant input from providers and have already heard back from several of them that they are pleased with where we've landed as it reflects much of the feedback we've received. Medicaid and the Healthy Michigan Plan provide health care coverage to approximately 2.2 million Michiganders, including low-income adults, children, pregnant women, elderly adults, and people with disabilities. These plans are key to achieving the MDHHS mission to improve the health, safety, and prosperity of residents. On July 29, 2022, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services announced the My Healthy Life Initiative, an initiative to strengthen Medicaid coverage by seeking public input via a comprehensive survey as the department prepares to rebid its Medicaid health plan contracts. The department was thrilled to receive nearly 10,000 responses to the survey. Survey questions sought feedback on broad priorities or strategic pillars, which are principles that will guide the state's policy and program areas to assist in determining where the state should focus its efforts. We will be publicly announcing very soon the final strategic pillars that will serve as the foundation for the procurement. Under the banner of My Healthy Life, MDHHS seeks to bring together the investment, creativity, and commitment of the department and its partners 
including health plans, providers, and communities to create a more equitable, coordinated, and person-centered system of care dedicated to ensuring Michiganders live a healthier life and have a healthier future. We are excited about this large-scale endeavor and believe that through partnerships with our Medicaid health plans that will be part of the new rebid, healthier communities will thrive. Our goal is to use this opportunity, as I've said in the past, to shift from a sick care industry to a true health care industry. Social determinants of health are the conditions in the environment where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risks. Social determinants of health have a major impact on people's health, well-being, and quality of life. Some examples include safe housing, transportation, racism, discrimination and violence, education and job opportunities, access to nutritious food, physical activity, polluted air and water, and others. Social determinants of health contribute to wide health disparities and inequities. For example, people who don't have access to grocery stores with healthy foods are less likely to have good nutrition. We have seen food deserts in many of our more impoverished communities. That raises their risk of health conditions like heart disease, diabetes, and obesity, and even lowers life expectancy relative to people who do have access to healthy foods. Just promoting healthy choices won't eliminate these and other health disparities. Instead, our state and our state's partners are ready to take action to improve the conditions in people's environments. To address the myriad of health inequities in our state, and in addition to the already existing social determinants of health strategic plan we have at the department, the Michigan Medicaid program is developing a formal policy to incorporate community health worker services as a fee-for-service recognized benefit to individuals with Medicaid coverage. Ensuring Medicaid beneficiaries have access to culturally responsive services is a key driver for acknowledging community health workers as a trusted connection within the existing service delivery model. Services provided by community health workers through this fee-for-service model will also allow individuals served by CMHs to receive services from them. We are also pursuing federal approval for a new targeted case management benefit as a method of improving care coordination and facilitating health improvements for Medicaid beneficiaries with justice-involved backgrounds. This benefit would afford Medicaid-enrolled justice-involved individuals with a case manager to support them in accessing health care services that they need, including peer and recovery support services, addressing housing needs, providing transportation, and more. It will help us to better meet this vulnerable population's health and social needs and will reduce long-term systemic costs. CMS and Michigan provide integrated care organizations with risk-adjusted capitation payments to finance all Medicare and most Medicaid services. My Health Link is the program that supports these dual program beneficiaries and operates in four regions spanning the following counties, Barrie, Berrien, Branch, Calhoun, Cass, Kalamazoo, Macomb, St. Joseph, Van Buren, Wayne, and all counties in the Upper Peninsula. CMS has issued a final rule requiring all state Medicare Medicaid plans, just like our My Health Link program, to transition to something called a dual eligible special needs plan, also known as a DSNP, by January 1, 2026. Michigan has submitted a plan to transition the My Health Link into a highly integrated dual eligible specialty needs plan. Under Michigan's transition to a highly integrated dual specialty needs plan approach, 
contracted managed care plans would provide most covered benefits for their dual eligible enrollees, but specialty behavioral health services would remain carved out. This option does include physical health plus long-term care supports and services, including the home and community-based services program and long-term care, and maintains the existing MyHealthLink program structure to the extent possible to assure a smooth transition of the program to an integrated DSNP model. It can also support successes from MyHealthLink, including exclusively aligned enrollment and integrated enrollment materials can be included in this model. And finally, I'd like to share with you some of our FY24 proposed investments here with you today. As we visit healthcare organizations across the state, there is one issue, as I mentioned, that you and I likely comes up in nearly every conversation, the healthcare workforce shortage. Staffing burnout and high demands have resulted in Michigan losing 1,700 staff hospital beds in two years. And the direct care workforce is now facing an all-time high of a 45% turnover rate. We believe it is important to do everything we can to address this challenge. The budget includes investments that strengthen Michigan's healthcare workforce and improve the state's ability to recruit new talent to healthcare professionals. Our total proposed investments are 305.1 million, 111.2 million general fund. 210 million gross supports a $1.50 increase in wages for direct care workers, providing Medicaid behavioral health services, care at skilled nursing facilities, community-based supports through My Choice, My Health Link, and Home Health Programs, care at homes and for the aged and adult foster care facilities, and in-home services funded through area agencies on aging. Direct care workers include registered professional nurses, licensed practical nurses, competency-evaluated nursing assistants, and respiratory therapists. The investment also includes a 90 million gross adjustment to increase wages for non-direct care staff employed in institutional long-term care settings. Non-direct care workers include, but are not limited to, housekeeping, maintenance, plant operations, laundry, and others. And finally, we propose establishment of a $5 million gross general fund annual scholarship program for students pursuing careers in behavioral health counseling, psychology, psychiatric nursing, or social work. One category of budget investments included in the fiscal year 2024 budget is expanding access to health care and reducing health care costs. These investments focus on improving Medicaid health access and equity, reforming nursing facility Medicaid rates, and expanding the Healthy Moms, Healthy Babies initiative. All Michigan mothers, infants, and families should have access to appropriate quality and timely care and access to resources that help them thrive. This is why the governor introduced the Healthy Moms, Healthy Babies initiative. Women now receive 12 months of continuous postpartum Medicaid coverage to reduce postpartum morbidity and mortality in Michigan, including access to doula care. The fiscal year 24 budget provides additional funding to enhance the Healthy Moms, Healthy Babies initiative and other services or support currently available to moms and families. The initiative includes funding for Plan First to provide family planning services, expand centering pregnancy sites, remove the five-year waiting period for children and pregnant women legally residing in Michigan before accessing Medicaid, support birthing hospital participation in the Michigan Alliance for Innovation on Maternal Health, also known as MIAIM, and enhance our perinatal quality collaboratives. The Michigan Perinatal Quality Collaborative is part of a nationwide effort to improve health outcomes for mothers and babies. This collaborative is comprised of nine regions with partnerships of hospitals, 
local health departments, health plans, and other stakeholders whose efforts led to increased screening and treatment for perinatal substance use disorder. The governor's budget will increase investment for the Perinatal Quality Collaborative by providing grants to local collaboratives, growing their ability to coordinate to improve maternal and infant health outcomes. Occasionally, adverse outcomes in pregnancy are not related to the pregnancy itself. Michigan was an early adopter of the Alliance for Innovation in Maternal Health, a national initiative with a goal of ending preventable pregnancy-related maternal deaths. This project has implemented three initiatives to reduce preventable maternal mortality, focusing on obstetric hemorrhage, severe hypertension, and safe reduction of primary cesarean birth. Severe maternal morbidity has decreased 10.5% since Michigan hospitals began participating in the model, and MyAIMS is expanding its focus to pregnancy-associated, again, not related to the pregnancy, injury and death, and will work to improve outcomes related to racial disparities and substance use disorders. And finally, centering pregnancy care models, supplement individual prenatal appointments with group sessions for mothers at similar pregnancy stages. These groups create an environment for women to receive and provide community support. Mothers receiving this type of prenatal care have a reduced risk of preterm births and low birth weight babies. Michigan currently has 14 sites certified to provide this type of prenatal care, and the governor's budget provides grants to these centers to expand and strengthen their offerings. Deputy Director, if you don't mind just going over these last two real briefly, we still have three more speakers we're trying to sneak in today, so. Oh, happy to do it, I didn't okay. know you had more speakers. Thank you so much. Absolutely. The second to last investment I wanna to talk to you about today related to healthcare access and equity is designed to increase stagnant reimbursement rates is to expand eligibility for our children's health care services and to add a recuperative care benefit to the Medicaid array. The reimbursement rate for Medicaid, many Medicaid services has gone untouched for years, and this has created a gap between costs and reimbursement. On the children's special health care expansion, young adults with chronic conditions like sickle cell disease, hemophilia, how, usually lose their coverage at age 21, but this budget includes funding for young adults to keep them up to age 26 and aligns the age requirement with the Affordable Care Act. And while there's an increase in the reimbursement rate as proposed, and there's also an expansion to the Children's Health Care Services Program, the proposal also supports assistance to those who are homeless and discharged from a hospital, where an individual who's in a hospital often goes to a shelter they would actually go to the recuperative care program, supporting a smoother transition and reducing chance of readmission. And we're happy to provide you with more information on that. And then lastly, the nursing facility Medicaid rate reform. Our nursing facility Medicaid reimbursement rates vary widely, and they do not always consider the severity of the patient, um, and the rates have been considered complicated and labor intensive. The proposal provides $110 million of one-time funding to phase in a new model over two years. Our department is committed to working with the nursing facilities to develop this updated model. We have had constructive and helpful discussions with our nursing home partners who have been helpful and committed, and we are optimistic that we'll continue to make great progress on a model that incentivizes high quality and low cost. So I just want to thank you again for the opportunity uh, to talk to you today. And um, again, apologize for running over. So thank you. No apologies necessary. This is uh, a huge budget. It's very important. Um, and uh, we appreciate your really comprehensive presentation today. I'm just going to allow two questions at this moment. And if members have additional questions, you know, feel free to route them through our office. Um, we're, we're happy to get your question in the right place. So I'm going to call on Rep Green to go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. No pressure, right? You're one of two. Um, 
I, my original question, 18% of our Medicaid spending is on the pharmaceutical area, um, according to your slide up there. Mm -hmm. um, recently, we moved from a managed care system for the pharmaceutical benefit to the preferred drug list administered by the department. Uh, I'm not, I don't remember, my brain is, if that was a year or two or three years ago. Um, what is the result of that change? Um, in other words, how much money have we saved or conversely, how much more have we spent on that pharmaceutical benefit? Yep, thanks for that question. I can't answer uh, the details of that. I can tell you that I'm aware of this program. I know that we've been working through it and we've been really partner partnering closely with the health plans and other providers. Uh, we're happy to get you additional detail, but that's just not something I have here today. But I'm aware of what you're referring to and we're happy to follow up if that's okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Rep Brabeck. Thank you, Chair. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> I had two questions, if that's all right. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Handling, for being here and to your entire team. Uh, this is, as the chair said, a very large budget, and so it's helpful to start to dive into this. I had two questions. One was about, uh, you were talking about telehealth uh, and what the pandemic has taught us about telehealth. Uh, one of the things that uh, we got to hear from the director last week, uh, and then you alluded to, was the phasing out of audio only. Uh, in, that's my understanding. In some cases. So can you expand more on that? Yes. When we implemented the uh, post-COVID, or I'm sorry, when we implemented the policies as soon as the public health emergency was established, we looked at how to provide the most flexibility as possible. Mm -hmm. And at the time, individuals were going into offices and there was very little telehealth. We quickly um, shifted over to instances where we just had audio only, where you just had a phone call. What we're doing in some cases is we're not jumping from audio only to in person. In a lot of cases we're saying not audio only, but at least face to face. So in other words, if they have the ability to be on some sort of electronic device, uh, FaceTime, whatever it is, a Zoom call, that going face to face so that we could still acknowledge the fact that individuals might not be able to go into the office is one way to transition. We had initially uh, had a policy that I think had a lot more of the, um, the shift going to either um, a little bit more of the shift, not a lot more, a little bit more of the shift going to either face-to-face uh, -face or in person. We did receive quite a bit of input, and I know the team was really flexible and really bringing things back. We had to line up what was necessary from a clinical, clinically appropriate perspective with giving people the flexibility. So I think we've done a really nice job. In a lot of cases, we um, might have said, if you used to be face-to-face, -face, we just need you in person for the initial encounter like your initial checkup. And then the whole year you could be on telehealth, uh, for example. So there are different, There's, a, I mean, it's pages and pages long of different things. And we've been mulling it over and going it over. It's been months and months. We've really taken it seriously and brought in as much input as possible. So if there are specific instances mm -hmm. that you're concerned about, would like to further discuss, we're happy to do that. Yeah, that would be great. I know I was talking with a provider in Southeast Michigan last week uh, and uh, you know, 42 percent of the population there, the the internet is there's internet reliability issues, and an even higher percentage of folks who don't have access to hardware. Uh, and so, being able to even do the the Zoom or the Doxy or any of those platforms that we have that are HIPAA compliant are really challenging. Uh, and we also know that, uh, or saw during the pandemic, that some uh, groups of folks who hadn't yet uh, access services, we're starting to access services via audio only. Mm -hmm. And so I'd hate to also, um, by going to audio only, or by going to, to just telehealth uh, via video, to then cut off that access for those populations as well. Yeah, no, appreciate the question. In some cases it was in place, in some cases there had to be a reevaluation. so happy to further discuss. That would be great. Mm -hmm. My second question was about hospitalization. You talked about that on page 17 mm -hmm. uh, and talked about how hospitals, there are issues with beds. Mm -hmm. um, that continues to be the case. You know, we continue to hear, I know that I'm not alone in this, uh, you know, from our local uh, hospitals about inappropriate placements. And I'm wondering about, um, you know, as we're doing, and we've made huge investments in our last budget uh, in infrastructure, 
you know, for our beds and uh, wondering when we're going to be adding beds uh, and allowing folks not just with NGRI status, but also SMI status to be able to have access to those beds. Uh, yeah, if you're referring to the state psychiatric hospital beds, yeah. So our state psychiatric hospital system is equally impacted by the workforce shortage. And so as we have looked across the board, we also have a severe direct care workforce shortage just in our state psych hospitals. Mm -hmm. We're also struggling with getting psychiatrists. So yes. we're actually implementing what we're doing with the, the broad industry in our state hospitals so that we could bring that back up. And as we ramp up our staff, we then open up more beds. And so our focus is really hitting not just the symptom, but the real problem, the mm -hmm. core root of the problem. That's great. And I'd love to have further conversations because I have some ideas too about how to um, in terms of recruitment and retention for mental health care providers. Oh, welcome that. Yeah, thank much. you. I really appreciate Absolutely. it. Thank you, Chair. All right. So sorry to the other members who had questions. Please feel free to forward any additional questions to my office. We will bundle them, send them over to HHS, and, and have their responses sent back to you. Uh, grateful uh, to Deputy Directors uh, Farrah Hanley and Amy Epke for being with us today, and uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch. Thank you so much. Next, I'd like to welcome, uh, we have two additional presenters, Marianne Huff, Executive Director of the Mental Health Association of Michigan, as well as Honorable Milt Mack, former Wayne County probate judge, current Michigan State Court Administrator Emeritus. Um, I'm gonna ask you to limit your comments to five minutes because we are quickly running out of time. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, good morning. Uh, Mary Ann Huff with the Mental Health Association of Michigan and Judge Mack with me. Um, we will limit it since there's been um, already a lot of time on presentation. So basically um, what we're here today to talk about is the importance of allocating funding to assisted outpatient treatment for community mental health organizations. And then um, I'll let Judge Mack speak to that and then the importance of establishing a children's navigator program for children and families um, who have serious emotional disturbance. So, Judge Matt, go ahead. All right. Just... Sorry about that. Uh, first of all, it's important to understand, I know many of you probably already understand this, but mental illness is a chronic condition. It's not solved by a temporary hospitalization. So in my 25 years on the bench, I saw the revolving door. The revolving door is still revolving. In fact, I thought my job was to keep it revolving. The, it's still, still happening today because we still have not responded appropriately. Uh, we had, uh, just for example, in uh, Michigan in 2020, the number one reason for visiting emergency departments was psychiatric care, not COVID. 166,000 visits. That generated 18,000 petitions for mental health treatment in Michigan's probate courts. That meant persons were temporarily hospitalized, a hearing was scheduled, and two doctors certified the person needed hospitalization right now. 60% of those petitions never made it to the courthouse. So what happened to those people? Well, I can give you an example. In Wayne County, in the last five years, 16,000 petitions for 9,000 people. Of those 9,000 people, 600, less than 1% of those petitions, represent 36% of all the persons who are petitioned. This is your revolving door. We looked at the 76 people with at least 10 petitions. And when I say they had 10 petitions, that doesn't mean that's the only time they were hospitalized. Because I know from talking to police chiefs and sheriffs across the state, that most of the time when law enforcement delivers someone to the hospital and signs a petition, the petition does not get filed with the probate court. So for these 76 people who actually had 10 petitions last year, we spent over $3 million on hospitalization, and we spent over $1 million on incarceration for these 76 people. None of these people went into outpatient treatment. You cannot put people in the hospital on a temporary basis and expect them to get well if you don't connect them to community treatment. Now the thing is, we now have the tool and the tool is assisted outpatient treatment. The legislature amended the law in 2018 to make it work. The problem was no money came with it. But on the other hand, in Michigan's law is now rate in the top three in the country, by the way. You don't have to show danger to self or others to get treatment. You don't have to be in crisis to get treatment. The question is, are you at risk of harm 
due to a lack of understanding of your mental illness. The immediacy of that risk of harm governs whether you're hospitalized or put into outpatient treatment. So SAMHSA was impressed by what Michigan had done and gave grants to Genesee County and Calhoun County. Genesee got 800,000, Calhoun 550,000. So what's happened? In Genesee County, they have over 400 people on AOT now. These are people with a history of hospitalization and incarceration. They're saving 70% on hospitalization. These individuals are being hospitalized at a lower rate than other people served by CMH who do not require a court order. Incarceration is down. The, their well-being is up. So the problem is for most Michigan residents, the system is not available to them yet because it still has not been funded. So uh, I could say a lot more, but I will say this, that Michigan's constitution promises that programs and services for the care, treatment, and rehabilitation of its citizens with serious mental illness shall always be fostered and supported. I think it's time that we delivered on that promise. The $15 million we're talking about is pretty modest. And uh, frankly, ratcheting up these programs will be a bit of a challenge. But for those thousands of people who come through the probate court on a regular basis, this is a lifeline to recovery. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I'm just going to speak quickly about the Navigator program. Um, <clears throat> Mental Health Association in Michigan, we um, have been working with a group of families for the last year. There's, this group is now mushroomed into over 450, and a lot of these families really struggle with accessing services and supports through the community mental health system. And what we're proposing is that you consider allocating funding for a navigator program for these families to help them learn how to advocate for themselves and their kids in a system that is very difficult to figure out how to navigate um, and how to advocate for what they need in the system. Thank you. Well, thank you both so much for being here. Um, Judge, I really appreciated uh, your on the ground uh, relation of what is happening and what you're seeing and, and the difference it can make for people if we are able to provide those uh, you know, services they need outside of hospitalization or incarceration. Director, um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, you are always advocating for our most vulnerable, and we appreciate that. Uh, we are not going to entertain questions at this time because we don't have time, but if any members have any, please forward them again to my office, and, and we'll forward them on to you if we have any. Thank you so much for being here uh, today. Madam Chair, I just mentioned I had published an article in Texas Tech Law Review which outlines the history of mental, Michigan's mental health system and which outlines the progress we've made and where we can go from there. I'd be happy to share it. Please do, and we'll be happy to share it with the members of the committee. Okay. Thank you so much. Our final speaker today is Dominic Pallone, who is the Executive Director of the Michigan Association of Health Plans. Welcome, Dominic. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, give me one second here, and I think I can. There we go. Uh, I will be brief, and I will fly through these slides. Uh, happy to take any follow-up questions, uh, but let me just start with an introduction. I'm Dominic Pallone. I'm the Executive Director of the Michigan Association of Health Plans. We represent 11 health plans that are licensed here in the state of Michigan, providing health care coverage to over 3 million Michiganders. Uh, eight of the nine Medicaid health plans are members of our association. Um, I think Deputy Director Hanley did a great job talking about the overview of managed care and the uh, role that the state Medicaid program has played historically in embracing managed care as a, as a way to help manage costs, have predictability in budgeting, which is certainly important to this subcommittee, um, but to also drive greater quality ac and access improvements for the Medicaid beneficiaries. Um, our, one thing I'll just mention here, not on the slide, is that our uh, contract, as the deputy director noted, is competitively bid. There's a rebid on the horizon. Um, the plans compete ferociously against one another uh, each time there is a rebid, obviously, over uh, access and outcomes. We do not bid on price. Uh, it's an important part of our program. Uh, the, the prices are set by the state actuaries and they're set evenly for plans. 
uh, it is not part of the uh, competitive bid process for the Medicaid program. Um, one area I want to jump into here just really quickly is to highlight something that is scary to us as we're looking at uh, budget expenses for Medicaid health plans and as you all are looking at budget expenses for the state specific to Medicaid uh, and that is drug costs. Um, this slide here just really quickly shows historical costs. This is not Medicaid specific. This, these are national numbers um, and a couple of uh, sources here. The GoodRx source is looking at list prices. These are prices set by manufacturers. Um, year over year showing the uh, aggregated percentage increases. The Bureau of Labor Statistics at the federal level is looking at a mix of cash prices and insurance prices. These are prices to individuals or insurers after discounts are applied. That's why those percentages are a little bit lower. And then the third bar there is inflation. If you take nothing away from this, take away inflation bad, pharmacy inflation unsustainable. Why that? relates to the Medicaid program is what we are seeing here uh, in the state. This is um, data up through state fiscal year 2022, specific to aggregated amongst all nine Medicaid health plans, um, showing the cost per script and the cost per member per month. That's what PMPM stands for. Um, month by month, so the, the number is a little hard to read, but that first data point is at 2019 of October, and the last data point is September of 2022. Um, you see those costs going up uh, at an alarming rate for us. Um, from a rate setting perspective, each year the actual costs have outpaced what the state's actuaries have set rates based on or the assumptions they've made in rate setting. Um, the, where the trend starts to go up uh, is, is roughly that first data point is October of 2020. Um, which is the start of the 2021 fiscal year, which was the start of the single preferred drug list. Within those pharmacy trends, just to highlight um, one area here on diabetic class, as you can see uh, with the colorful chart here, we're seeing um, diabetic drug class now representing 25% of all of our pharmacy spend. Uh, and one product is now making up 15% of that spend. That's a preferred product. Um, th this is uh, something we're very concerned with, and lawmakers, appropriators especially, we would encourage you to take a deeper dive into this. Again, happy to follow up with much more detailed information than, than we're able to provide here today. Um, as it relates to state fiscal year 24 as you're planning, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things here that we're concerned with and tracking. We will work obviously uh, with our partners at the department during the rate setting process to bring forth as much information as we can so that the state can set rates appropriately. Um, but we're seeing obviously uh, uh, pharmacy costs continue to exceed previous uh, projections. We've had some statutory changes uh, regarding prior authorization, PA-19, uh, which was passed a couple years ago. Uh, that will have an impact on rate development. We're seeing concerns with contract language around any willing provider that we estimate will have impact on rates. Uh, sickle cell policy changes have had impact on rates. There's many others. These are just some of the highlights. Overall, the, the uh, executive recommendation at this point um, is predicated on a 2.5% what's called an actuarially sound increase built into the uh, Medicaid areas of the rates, the, the health plan section line item and the Healthy Michigan line item in particular. Our initial estimates uh, have us somewhere between 7% and 8.8%. Um, I think as I look honestly in front of you all today, there's very little things in our society that have only gone up by 2.5% or are expected to only go up by an additional 2.5%. Healthcare costs is certainly not beneath the rate of general inflation. And as I just showed earlier, pharmacy costs, specifically within healthcare costs, are greatly out, outpacing uh, uh, normal uh, inflation. Um, I won't cover this. I know the department did a great job getting into timelines in a much clearer slide than I have. I will note just the first bullet point here. We would suggest, whether it's in a 23 supplemental or in the 24 budget, that an additional $20 million uh, be given to the department to help in redeterminations. We can't stress it enough. This will be a monumental task. 
um, that the department is embarking on. Our member health plans, certainly our partners, we are committed to making this as smooth as possible, but it will be a heavy lift. Education and outreach is needed. Um, I referenced here before the uh, uh, single PDL effects, this is net costs. Um, so as you see here, the, the um, pharmacy, the overall expense is that top line, the net cost is the bottom line. We did see some initial savings when it, when it did take effect. I think Representative Green had a question on that earlier, earlier by our estimates. Uh, in that budget year, fiscal 21, the estimates assumed 190.8 million in savings. The results of that on the net have been about $80 million in net savings actually realized, so it was short about 110 of what was expected. As we compare back to that base year, the following year was an increased cost of 56.7 in the net as a cost increase, and then 115.9, <clears throat> excuse me, as a net cost increase compared to that base pre-single PDL year. Uh, and to close here, just a, a few, uh, Summarizing here, our recommendations as you're considering the fiscal 24 budget and any fiscal 23 supplementals that might apply to MDHHS, we would suggest making sure that as you're moving through this budget process that enough funding is provided to cover between a 7.0 and an 8.8% 8 .8 8 .8 actuarial soundness adjustment. The dollar figure in that is not listed on here because what is unknown is the caseload, how many people you're gonna have plays into that. Uh, we'd suggest a $20 million either in a fiscal 23 supplemental or 24 budget to assist in uh, Medicaid redeterminations. This would not be money flowing to the plans. This is money for the state to spend. Um, and then we'd also suggest that consideration be given to letting the health plans once again manage their own formularies to continue down the path that the state has already started on on dental integration uh, to, to better increase overall health outcomes and oral health outcomes and that as we'll work with other uh, subcommittees as well, that uh, in-depth look at it, better integration of behavioral and physical health could uh, yield overall improvements in health for the Medicaid population. And with that, uh, happy to take any questions, follow up, or uh, if there are any here. Thank, Thank you, you, Director Pallone. Um, I'm just gonna point to my colleagues, the information for to, to get in touch with uh, the health plans is in the back of your packet. It's right there as well. Um, I, we are already losing people, so I'm going to thank you very much for your cold hard truths that you've presented today. Uh, we will take that into consideration when we are making our budgetary decisions, um, and we appreciate you being a resource for us and all that you do. So thank you so much for being here today. Um, Representative Skaggs moves to excuse absent members. Hearing no objection, absent members are excused. Seeing no further business, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>